Hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much to Dan Marler and Steve Waterman and uh, the incredible things that we're doing here at the Rat Pack. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Kilo Delta 9 Oscar Delta Hotel. I've been an amateur radio operator since 1994. Um, I'm a retired state trooper from Florida. I had uh, my my Crown Vic and my Ford Mustang look like a uh, HRO or uh, DX engineering because I had all these radios in there and everything like all the other law enforcement in South Florida because we experienced uh, hurricanes every summer. Our communication vulnerabilities occurred. We lost communications with our public safety repeaters. I can tell you wild stories, but being able to talk on Simplex, uh, the 14691 Fort Lauderdale repeater on top of the 110 tower, which is 110 stories high in Fort Lauderdale. That was the best thing since sliced bread using car to car channel with each other for interoperability <laughs> than, than the VHF uh, 154.290 or the inner city 155.370 frequency. Uh, we had such many good times. So having said that, I'm with FEMA Region 5. That's my experience in amateur radio communications. Um, I'm the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinator here in uh, Chicago. I work with our six states, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin with the state emergency operations centers. And also with our regional emergency communication coordinating working group, which is under the um, Post-Katrina Reform Act, which is in the federal register as a congressional mandate. We have 10 region coordinators, we call them Rex. I'm, I'm one of them here in region five. Uh, many of us are amateur radio operators. And with the uh, with the awesome ability to use volunteer resources in collaboration and partnership from private industry, public safety, and and with AWRL, Racy's Aries, many many groups, uh, the part the partnership is growing very strong. Uh, we notice and recognize the value of Oxcom. I'm going to give you an example. In Region Five, we have. 258 radio operators on our roster willing to participate in our nets and augment our response needs in Region 5. Having said that, we value Oxcom tremendously because not only are volunteered resources in that group, but there are law enforcement personnel, fire personnel, public safety personnel, uh, air traffic controllers, dentists, doctors, you name it, all walks of life, security officers, people who are retired, people who have credible experience that can bring to the table their ability to communicate civilly with each other and help government. So in our OXCOM is a file cabinet and each drawer is a component of the file cabinet that creates OXCOM. You have shares, you have Aries, you have AWRL, you got Coast Guard Auxiliary, Air Force, Mars, Army, Mars, um, shares, interoperability, all, all the amateur components. So all those come together, really, really make interoperability success when um, our own government communications can potentially come down. So uh, I'll get off that bandwagon. I'm getting excited talking about it because I, I really have a heart in it. And uh Things are coming together. So thanks to Dan Marler and you folks. Um, I'd like to present to you about the integrated public alert warning system test analysis. As you know, earlier this month, we had a national testing that occurred and we do it every three years. Um, contrary to belief that many people approached me that they thought it was a conspiracy because things are going on, that all of a sudden it was a coincidence that this iPause alert was going out. That's not the case. We do this every three years. And it's to test the national system because frequently we have more agencies coming aboard to use IPAWS. And the main components that are the transmissions of IPAWS alerts are the 911 call centers, the public safety access points, and at the local county municipal levels, because that's where the ground truth comes from. If a, if a police agency wants to tell the motoring public to stay away from a certain intersection because of the bad incident with the chemical release, they can geo, uh, geofence the cell phones, if you will imagine, over that area 
to alert the motoring public to stay away from the uh, the intersection to reduce congested traffic and potentially even reduce uh, a tertiary secondary accident. Uh, another thing from Kenosha, Wisconsin, is civil unrest. Uh, Kenosha County Sheriff, they transmitted IPAWS messages for the motoring public to that the exit to Interstate 94 into Kenosha County were closed. Not only that, we have the Amber Alerts for um, for missing for for children, uh, Silver Alerts for our um, senior citizens for their welfare, and um, it's it's really it's really taken a stronghold for situation awareness and helping the public understand um, what's going on around them. So it's a behavior model. It's a it's a method of telecommunications to change the behavior of people, the user that receives the message on some recommendations of actions. So uh, for the next slide here, from the executive summary, there was a high volume of online conversation around this IPOS test the weeks that were leading up to the distribution of the alerts. And in this conversation, it was heavily concentrated using Twitter and social media, TikTok, Facebook, um, uh, Twitter, and things of that nature. And it was getting a lot of notoriety and popularity. And there was also a high volume of comment commentaries conveying what, what the general public had some mistrust toward the governments I've explained um, for the distribution of this alert. So the alerts were largely neutral and focused on the FEMA's role in deploying the alerts. FEMA has a national laboratory in Maryland where they welcome agencies that come on board to use the software of their choice and to teach the dispatchers or the user uh, how to use the software and a computer associated with this at their laboratory testing facility. And they learned they learned a lot of the attributes on how to successfully transmit the language in a word document with so many characters and how it's going to be chosen on a polygon, if you will, over a, a GIS map for the area of coverage of the message. So that's what we have in place. FEMA is in charge and they're embraced for overseeing this program. And they have a training center there. And they also work with private industry partners, software developers that are registered with FEMA and have the authority to distribute their software through a purchasing agreement on the local user agency. So there was some public sentiment around the alert that continues to be largely neutral. A high volume of people were expressing their surprise and sharing humorous content around how the people would re even receive these alerts. And so there was a significant volume of people sharing what they were started to receive the test earlier that they did not receive the alerts. And the week leading up to this alert activation, in a prediction, a high volume of conversation from people discussing how to divert or block the alerts by turning our cell phones off or putting in airplane mode. And even on your general settings in your smartphone, there's a little tab that uh, you can switch off in the inability preventing the user from receiving the alert tone and subsequent message itself. So in the iPods conversation surrounding the October 4th test, there were approximately 31,300 Twitter posts and 21,000 public posts between other social medias. And as you can see here in a depiction of the graph, the volume of contact by sources, you can see in the red was a news media, YouTube, um, not so much, Facebook and Twitter, Twitter really skyrocketed um, to, to a lot amount of people, but it was just days up to the event. But then, of course, there were reminders by different social media groups that this was coming. And so you can see how the spike came up and then there was some discussion about this. So on Facebook, the day of the test are approximately almost 10,000 individuals that uh, were sharing information about this. So the awareness um, was significant. 
And I know there's millions and millions of people in the United States and the visitors here in our country that um, that commute in and out of our country and they have Facebook as well, but specifically for Facebook and, and the iPods conversation, we thought it was very interesting. So as a, re as a result from the aftermath or the after action report or the recommendations of future messaging, uh, it was turned out that the timing alerts were were approximate or around discussing the planned distribution times. Um, some social media outlets and some outlets that conveyed this alert was going to happen, they were given approximate time, uh, either before or after, and the time zones. You got to remember, you know, people in California they they announced the time zone was, I think, one thirty or 2.30 Eastern, and that was 1.30 Central. And you can imagine in the Pacific Coast or even Hawaii, it's even going to be further behind. So um, there were some inconsistencies with the time zone. But I do have to tell you that in looking at the geographical information system analysis on a GIS system, the, uh, the Samoa Islands, Saipan, Guam, Hawaii, and the Oconus with the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, and not and also to include the United States, they were all lit up in red. Their transmission zones and capabilities through servers and messaging outlets with the different software vendors that are used in the IPAWS infrastructure was successful in getting the transmission out to all those uh, locations I just explained. Now, whether or not some people had their phone on or off, or the phone was on and they're capable selectivity of turning the notification and ability to receive the alert was on or off was up to the user. But those are the two mitigating factors. However, the success of the transmission was very, very uh, well coordinated. Another item was a context on languages. When they prepared some fact sheets language leading up to the test, they want to include various languages that included test and what was important. Some jurisdictions reported that because of their populations of a certain nationality was much more prominent than another. For example, um, the Hispanic, you know, it's the second, I believe is the second largest language in the world, but here in the United States, it's, it's very prominent in many communities. But then you have a lot of um, other people that have relocated from other parts of the world um, Eastern Europeans, um, in California, you have a lot of, um, uh, folks from, uh, South, Southeast Asia, um, Vietnamese, Chinese, including Japanese, uh, that don't have English as their primary language, but it would have been beneficial to those outlets that had the ability to transmit messages in that geographical area and the contents of those nationalities could have had the messages tailored to their language. So that was that was a learning that was a learning curve there. And the vulnerable groups too. There was a high volume of online conversation of how the iPods might impact people in unsafe living situations with hidden phones. There were some people expressed their concerns about how the alerts would impact students or children with disabilities and sensory considerations. So this was very unique because people who are deaf, how are they going to get notified? Um, uh, uh, people who are blind uh, through Audible, other Audible resources. So um, the variables are there. It's not just phone or cellular phone, but you have the internet capability televisions and the transmission through television internet from the different cable providers. And of course, you know, if people turn their cell phone off or the button to have the inability to decide they don't want to receive the message, you know, then again, if you have a TV, you can just turn the TV off itself. But uh, there was only a small amount of criticism that FEMA didn't address of the concerns. And that is very good. Um, having little criticism and a lot of uh, positive uh, responses again, prove that this test in 2023 was successful, especially now that you have social media and you have a lot of people using uh, new technology and telecommunications. 
So pro proactive concerns on the messages and common concerns and questions were, um, like I said, people turn the phone off or in, in airplane mode. So in the prevalent themes we had, the top themes before the alert was distributed, um, a high volume of politicians, local emergency management agencies, and advocates raising concerns about how the alerts could even uncover hidden cell phones owned by people in safe living conditions in the days leading up to the test. An example of that um, is not that there are a lot. I don't know. I haven't done the research. I haven't um, checked with the the considerable uh, empirical um, validity of the numbers that are out there, but I can tell you what they're uh, they're talking about are people like, for example, domestic violence survivors. They go and they they leave their partners. They're in shelters. They're in safe havens, and they're issued cell phones that are legacy cell phones, but can still use and acquire the reception of these alerts. Having said that. Those phones are free to the spouses of not only men and women, but victims of domestic violence that are in safe havens where they receive the, the signals. And uh, and then also when you talk about unsafe living situations, we could we could go on about shelters and um, the underserved underserved uh, community. But there was also a predictable predictably high volume of people sharing that they intended to turn off their phones. So we're here again, we're going back to the airplane mode. Several teachers and parents expressed their concern of how the alerts would impact students in the school. Now, uh, children with autism, sensory concerns for their health conditions. I mean, this was a concern by some parents. You know, how many, when you think back in our families and our children, our grandchildren, for those who are on the call, how many of them have young adults elementary school children for that matter down to that age that have cell phones they're they're cell phones that you can purchase that are tailored for family usage and and um, children so that the parents can have direct contact with the children especially when you have an increase in the last few years of gun violence in schools and so as parents you know i'm a parent we want to protect our kids with technology at our disposal it's natural to provide them a certain type of cell phone, but then there was a concern. So having said that, with all these children in our school systems throughout the country, some parents express concerns about how how will impact the children's behavior in terms of being startled, being afraid that something's going to happen. Um, and I had a couple school districts call me at the FEMA office and inquire, uh, is there going to be an alert tone? How long will alert tone happen? What's the volume of the alert tone? Um, should the child turn the phone down? Should the teacher take the phone away from the child until the alert is done and give it back to the child? Uh, there were so many questions and there was a lot of discretion that was imposed to the school authority that called me, but um, I provided information of what was actually happening. happening. And then I guide them to maybe using some best practices in the thought process of what the child might experience. So that that was something that was talked about. You don't realize that, but uh, that was interesting. So in a successful distribution and awareness of this, a lot of the online conversation following alerts were generated by people confirming that they actually successfully received the test afterwards. Uh, there were some also people sharing they never received the test, but some of those people forgot to activate the alert capability for reception. Um, some people shared that they only received the alert on one device despite having a television station nearby that didn't receive the signal. Well, that could have been true based on the cable provider or the TV transmission provider and depending on what geographical area that they were in. But because of cellular infrastructure and telecommunications with private industry and all our cell phone partners, um, the agreements and relationships with um, FCC, NTIA, and the government has been very robust and uh, healthy. And um, I can actually, in confidence, say that uh, our relationship with telecommunication providers in the RECWIG is is very positive, and uh, and um, other agencies that augment those relationships and supporting FEMA like CISA has been very instrumental as well. 
A high volume of people sharing different experiences receiving the test, such as the alert didn't make the sound or receive the alerts later than others. So it depends on the telephone, the legacy of the phone, what the capabilities of the phone are, the options that you can select for. So that was something that was to take in consideration. And you can see from the uh, circular uh, pie chart how uh, the share of voice topics of interest occurred from 1% to 85%. Earlier than anticipated alerts, following the distribution of alerts, there was a high volume of conversation again around people receiving the test about two minutes earlier than they previously reported from the, the 1420 or 220 p.m. Eastern time. And the volume of conversation has declined significantly. That's only because you have to remember, you know, the speed of light is 168,000 miles per second. So radio signals are basically from an FCC exam, 186,000 miles per second. So electronic pulse from the time a person transmits the message through the telecommunication infrastructure going to the antenna and being retransmitted, there is going to be a delay. Um, If it's one or two minutes or depend on the provider that they're uh, having the relationship with uh, to transmit the signals for the various different telecommunication providers, there's going to be a delay. So um, that delay of about two minutes, I would say is reasonable. Um, Public sentiment around the early distribution continues to lean negative, with most people expressing that they were startled to receive the alert early. Well, you know, that, 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 that may happen. That's, that's an expectation. Um, I can't, I can't explain why people are focused that if it's going to occur at this particular hour and minute, they focus on that. And if it's before or less and it's reasonable, they compound it to where it wasn't exact. Well, we're not getting into seconds either. So um, that was a uh, 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 interesting note to to, uh, understand. And that while most people shared that they were startled by the test because of noise and because it came earlier than previously reported, a lower volume of people shared that they had anticipated tests were not startled by its rival. That's probably because they knew what was coming uh, because of the media outlets and the discussions of social media. The user were prepared and was probably informed beforehand, having a reasonable expe- expectation that there's going to be these loud tones. And those loud tones, as we know, is to capture the audience, capture the user, to stop what you're doing stop your behavior uh, and focus on what's about to be transmitted in its language and communication to the user through the cell phone. So that's the purpose of the, t- of the alert tone is to get the person to change their behavior and to, and to focus on what is about to be received through the communication message. The alert sent in English and Spanish. As I explained earlier, there was only a moderate level of people expressed confusion over why they received alerts in Spanish. Um, well, you know, this is this is a uh, this is regarding with the infrastructure on private industry and the and the and the program developers that and the vendors that use this. Some some of the transmissions that were used uh, selected Spanish because of geographical area. Sometimes that geofencing goes beyond that location and goes outside the geofencing. Maybe an, a county, maybe another county. Maybe the signal was on a on top of a mountain, and the care the 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 message transmission was promulgated maybe a little bit longer because of the height of the transmission being on the mountain. That people outside the area that we were not in a community that spoke Spanish received it in Spanish. So there's a lot of variables that we have to analyze and say, okay, just because you received in Spanish and didn't necessarily want it, what were the conditions? And as radio operators, we, we, we understand that because we talk on repeaters, we use simplex, we understand propagation. We understand that ultra high frequency frequencies penetrate through walls inside buildings better than uh, low band or VHF uh, because of the wavelength. So there's a lot of variables that are technical in nature that we'd have to analyze that. But that's just an example of what I mentioned uh, some people share their understanding that's related to a person's phone settings, which is also true. A low volume of people share their belief that some of the Spanish alerts lacked additional details. That was interesting because that comes from 
uh, the translation of language not having too much information, but it's a learning process. And, and that's why we test things. That's why we conduct these analysis and result of the tests are to learn best practices. So we understand that the, some of the information for the Spanish people to, to, to use it, um, to uh, have more information and guidance uh, in their language so they can understand what are the expectations? What is what is the person in the message? What's the content? What is it that, that the government wants me to know? So of course, the line discussion will go forth the English. You can see that the the, um, the graph there, and uh, how little is in Spanish. But that's okay. It's it's all positive. Other specific issues concerned reported that there have been some unverified reports of some cases. A presidential alert, excuse me. And just a national alert. I haven't heard that. I, I cannot speculate on that. And as, as I said, we know here a lot of individuals are speculating by some form of receive a presidential alert other than the national alert itself. Some organizations of those folks who have been here to the facilities were part of the members of the community to share their experience. that. Um, they're a very important uh, component in society. We're so it's it's important to understand what their experience and how they what their disabilities. The moderate volume of people sharing content suggests that they were unfamiliar with the regular testing. We get new folks that, that get new cell phone technology and they weren't unfamiliar with it. Um, the younger generation, even senior senior citizens. So all walks of life, uh, part of technology because society uses it and expectations are. Now, oh, I'm, I'm sorry? It's breaking up pretty badly. Okay. Language issues. Subnational has reported on how to test the caused interruptions and the profile events. So um, maybe there was a, a, a big event going on and they 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 submitted to test how to interrupt that event. How are so on? that's what we're on. Yes. Uh, you might turn off your, your uh, webcam and see if that helps because your body will break it up pretty good. Okay. Let me go up there and uh, stop video. Okay. Is that better? Keep it going and see what happens. Okay. All right. So um, in my presentation, I want to talk about the after actions regarding social media and the awareness of the public in terms of how it affected them and some of the lessons learned that came out. Now, I thought that would be a little bit more interesting than seeing how many cell phones were transmitted or having an analysis of those high numbers. I think it was more important for an awareness of the lessons learned. So we know for um, foreign language is a consideration, the, the usefulness in helping people with disabilities, um, some considerations that we've learned of parents of hundreds and thousands of schools across our country, how the alert would affect the child of, a, of acquiring the possession of the phone while in a public school. Um, so these are some of the examples I wanted to cover for your situation awareness that I would, thought it was interesting. And um, and uh, so that's my uh, report from Social Listening and the analytics team from FEMA on their external affairs regarding the, uh, the, the uh, interesting information that was compiled of the activities before and leading up to the IPAWS alert messaging and afterwards. Victor. You got a bunch of things in chat, and why don't you just come on board and ask them in person? And I would do that. Thank you very much, and good evening. Uh, I forgot my question, but uh, we'll get to them. Uh, I know one of them was the idea of school kids, the phones, and the alerts going off. And, and I've always thought that was the time to suspend teaching and turn and address the situation and make that a teaching moment. What was the result of 
your message to the schools? Was it to te- have the teachers explain what this was all about, or was it just ignore it and hope it goes away? I I would hope that, and it would be fair and reasonable to say that uh, teachers in their own right, through their you know their their um, skills and relationship with children, and and they knew. I, I would hope that they knew that this alert was going to be transmitted and that beforehand they could have made a decision based on the principal of the school or the guidance of the school or the recommendations of the certain school district on what precautions that would take. Now, their decision, as you mentioned, to take the phone away from the child for that temporary time or to stop teaching and allow the students to experience the alert tones and then um, discuss it and carry on. But that's a very good question. And under under the decision of the various school districts and the jurisdictions and the public and private schools, I would think that would be a decision that would be probably rested on them. Um, Not to mention as well that parents who knew that this alert was coming out and that there was a concern of their dependent child, whether they're they're legal guardians of the child or parents or not. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I would hopefully think and say that it's reasonable that the legal guardian or the parent of the child would discuss in advance Mm -hmm. before they are left at the school to to go to school to learn that this was coming or the parent may themselves decide to keep the phone for the day. I don't know. There's so many different variables. And to tell you, um, I don't know. I don't know the specifics of that. The choices uh, that they could make to do that are, I would say, are reasonably valid. And the options that are there, um, I uh, that's a very good question. That's something that that could be considered to to be looked into in much more detail. And I'll carry on with that too. I'm 65 and I still remember fire drills when I was in grade school. Yes. This day when a fire alarm goes off, I'm walking out of my building. If I'm in production, I shut my line down. I'm walking out of the building. There's no question. And yet what I see today is well, we didn't know you could do that or you're not supposed to do that or, oh, it's just a fire alarm. We don't care. So that's enough of that, I guess. I guess my second question becomes the immigrants and English in the second language. And if you would, back up for a second, please, and tell me that those individuals that use their native language are using their native language on their phone. And I'm a pure English speaker. I'm sorry, I never learned Spanish, I never learned French. But are there not programs that convert my English conversation into Japanese, into Spanish, and then translate them back automatically I don't understand why this isn't quite yet embedded in this program that you're describing here tonight, the iPod. Thank you. Have a great week. Uh, Victor, that's a very good question. That's because the ability for artificial intelligence to know which user is using what language and then transcribe it into their language on an instant is a difficult task. Not to mention that when you purchase a cell phone, the general parameters and the uses of the software and the applications that you can download of translation applications. I mean, if you go into smartphones and look at the applications available for a user to select that could be free or purchase for translation capabilities, there are so many there. And, um, uh, from David, you, I mentioned that it's changing behavior. Uh, for those on a call who don't know, I'm act- I am also a psychologist. I have a doctorate degree in psychology. I have a master's degree in general psychology, but I'm registered with the American Psychological Association. I don't have licensure, 
to do clinical diagnosis, but to do the empirical research meeting doctoral standards for publication, I have I have the certification to do that. And I can tell you that if you're driving a car, let, let's take this example of a cell phone. The reason why we're conducting our daily businesses and that, uh, you know, we have a cell phone and it's on, it rings, it's ringing to get your attention, to stop what you're doing, to answer a phone call some because somebody's reaching out to you, whoever it is. Well, the same principle applies. The, the contention of the government is to, if they're going to send an alert, have an audible tone to capture the audio so the listener stops what they're doing. If I'm having a conversation with somebody and the alert tone gets off to acquire and capture my attention and I stop the conversation to pick up my phone to look at the message, I, my behavior has changed. That's what I imply by change in behavior. My normal faculties, my thought process, my visualization, you, what have you, but just doing normal operations or normal activities, and I hear this alert tone and I stop what I'm doing to look at it, uh, the behavior of my actions in terms of that type of function is changed. So that's why there's alert tone. It's simply to tell you, it's to get your attention to answer the phone. Behavior is is a uh, movement, it's actions, it's it's cognitive. You have a thought process, you thought, you register it, answer my phone, I physically move, that's behavioral and it's positive. We can talk about behavioral all aspects, but that's what the purpose of the alert tone is, is to get you to answer your phone, get you to pick up the phone and receive the message. So uh, that's, what, that's what I meant. It wasn't the co contents of something else, behavioral engaged, it's about getting you to Look at your look at your 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 device. You hear the audio, or if you're visually impaired and you have it on vibrate, you hear it vibrating. You you seek to uh, retrieve the phone and 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 uh, re recover the message. And then if the message tells you there is an active shooter, or if the message tells you there's a bad accident at this intersection, stay away. That is modifying behavior of the motoring public not to not to operate their vehicle in that direction and cause more congestion at an intersection where the police want you to stay away. Or if the audio tone captures your your transmission and the agency is asking to be on alert for a child, they're theoretically modifying your behavior that you're going to be start looking out for a young boy wearing jeans and an orange shirt. He's seven years old and he's missing this neighborhood. So if you're driving your vehicle, you're more apt to be on more of an alert process in your cognitive skills to assist government to help find this person or this child. So it it, it is a it is a little bit of a uh, um, a behavior modification of an instrument that's used in society. Um, and that's, it's fair and reasonable to say that. Okay. I, if I'm not wrong, Carl, I would think the language thing should be on the user of the cell phone, whatever language they're, they're uh, comfortable with within one family. It might be one guy, mother or father is very comfortable with Spanish, but the children are very comfortable with English or whatever. That should be a, a decision on their side rather than software trying to figure it out, I would think. Yeah, and, and this is an opportunity for improvement um, as we move forward to the capabilities and the innovation that could be administered in this program. I think it's exciting to know um, what what this can what this can what what the improvements could be. And I think it's very positive and you bring up a good point. Okay, Scott, you got your hand up. You want to take it away, sir? Thank you very much, Dan. Carl, great to see you again. Yes, and, too. Uh, great, great presentation. And, and um, you bring up some very valid points. And um, Victor kind of brought up a couple interesting ones. You know, I, I'm old school, I guess. Um, I've been in the fire service 27 years. And, you know, and doing by, 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 by I don't know. I'm trying to choose the right words, but I, I've been to fire drills where kids just stand around and stare at you like, 
what am I supposed to do? Because we've taken the element out of what you and I used to do in school. We heard, like Victor said, we heard the fire drill. There was we duck and cover for an earthquake. But now we, we, we've kind of, if we're asking parents, well, is it okay if my, my son or daughter listens to this alert tone? Create some big issues from a public safety standpoint on on, on how, how do we how do we how do we work with these people because we're creating a society of um of people who are going to be basically just standing there wondering what's going to happen next. Well, you know, when it comes to parental, yeah, I, I guess my point is I didn't have to have my parents' permission in high school to have a fire drill. Yes, I remember. I, I I'm 58 years old. I I'm not too far behind. You. You, well, you remember going under a desk at yes. school because yes. the, the the missiles were coming from Russia. Yes, we were taught. I was taught. I remember in third grade, get under a desk. They had the siren go off for the school a missile attack, and the Russians were sh going to shoot missiles. And I that I remember that really well. Absolutely, but we didn't have to get our parents' permission to do it. And it just seems like we're, we're we're shifting away from we're shifting away from things, and and we're going to have a and it, again it goes back to a public safety issue is if people just stand around it and are waiting for direction for something to occur, it becomes a huge burden on public safety. You you make a valid point, and um, that that's so true, and it can be, you know, controversial, but this is something that. Um, is we recognize right. the government recognizes and uh they're going to find i'm sure they'll find some research and through professionals um better ways to um circumvent the the potential that um when a user should be notified and you should acquire and understand the message then not as you say uh what is what does this mean? I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Is this okay? Are, exactly. are we okay? You, you know, um, that that's something to contend with as well. And there's so many different variables. You bring up a good point there, and, and, Scott. And I guess my last question is: so, I, I guess I can't bring out the therapy dolls, and we can't have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, mannequins in public safety. I'm a I'm a former EMT. It was nationally registered. Uh, mannequins and those things we use for training. Absolutely. I'm just giving you a hard time, but I, I, again, yeah. great to see you. Great presentation as always. <laughs> and I, I look forward to hearing what, what you have to talk about because you bring a lot of good insight um, from the psychological world and bring it into the emergency public safety realm. And, and, and you try to blend it. And, and that's a really good thing because we need to have more of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even in the amateur community, we go on critical critical incidents. We man shelters. We mm -hmm. respond. We're the ground truth in our community mm -hmm. and our ability to gather the information collectively and with a reasonable conjecture of our thought process and cognitive skills to say we need to to deliver the information so the receiver can hear and articulate what we're saying and stop the stresses of excitement stop the stressors of being interrupted by people that can that are distractive to the transmission of the person making the transmission i mean there's a lot of different variables how many how many did we go to a critical incident and had to take the radio away from the user and give it to someone who had more experience or had a better posture i mean absolutely, absolutely. That, 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 that that that's a that's a hell of a phenomenon to understand and the attribute and an aftermath the person um, collectively didn't realize what they were doing or they did, but they had good intentions. There's so many different variables. Absolutely. That's I'm going to yield back my time. Thank you very much for taking your time. We really yeah, enjoyed it. I'm sorry. I was getting off, but uh, that's why we have the position task books. That's why yes. we have those things. They're behavioral. They're behavioral oriented. A absolutely. Thank you very much, Carl. You yes. know, I really appreciate your enthusiasm and uh, um, your what you what you what you got personally involved in all of this here, Carl. And some of these guys that's on tonight do too. It's a uh, uh, it's a, a commitment to think, eat, and sleep this stuff. Gene, you're on next. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but I guess it could turn into a question. 
uh, on the day of the alert, and my iPhone next to me on, I had my iPad, which has a data plan, which basically turns it into a very big iPhone. I mean, I have cellular access plus Wi-Fi always on at the same time. And about 10 feet of me was my TV, which I get a satellite signal from. I got no alert on the TV, no alert on the iPad, but my iPhone did go off. The uh, the alert did was triggered on my iPhone. I guess the question is, when it comes to the TV working off a satellite, how does satellite reception compare to uh, landline, not landline, but like cable? service when it comes to these alerts? That's a very good question. And I wish I had a very good answer for you. I don't know. I don't know the parameters and the intricacies about that, how a cable provider or a satellite provider, how they are connected with the infrastructure in this modality of the iPods alerting system. So I don't know, sir, I, I don't have an answer. I do know people who did receive the alert on their televisions, but it, it, it was from it varied from carrier to carrier. And there's so many different carriers out there. Um, so I, I apologize. I, I just don't know. Um, and I, I don't want to speculate. I just don't know, sir. I'm sorry. Well, there's no reason to apologize. I mean, I, I was just kind of like wondering if that was a factor because way in the past, whenever I've had a uh, cable, you know, hooked up as opposed to satellite, I would always get those monthly tests. Yes. But, I mean, yeah. using satellite right now was new to me. I mean, when I moved into this neighborhood, there was no cable. I mean, yes. If you wanted TV or and or internet, you had to do fiber for the internet or satellite for the TV. Now they've installed just pe this past month and a half cable, but I don't have I haven't hooked it up. I'm happy with my satellite reception. <laughs> so I was just wondering if you know if if yeah like he said if it's it comes down to the provider that were well, the people who control the satellite maybe. Yeah. You know that's wow. true. But you have no reason to apologize. You've been doing great tonight. Oh, thank you. And 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 I, I'm being sincere because I, I you, you answer me a question. I would like to give you the answers, but I don't I don't have that. And um, um, I'll do what I can to you. you uh, I can put my email in the chat and I can see what I can find out from my colleagues or the experts and give you uh, give you an answer. I would welcome that. Thank you. Yes, I'll put my email in the chat. Okay. I have myself muted. I'm sorry, Carl. Just email that to me, and I'll stick it in on the, the documents to people who watch this on on YouTube. Okay, Dave, you're finally on, sir. Go for it. Hey, Carl. It's good to see you again. What impressed me most about October fourth was that there was no chatter about anyone trying to rickroll the alert. And so that had me suddenly impressed with FEMA's cybersecurity sanitation. Uh, they were doing a lot of stuff right. But yes. I'm curious why you never mentioned Reddit as part of the social media. And that's just because that's where I would look for trouble if it was coming. And a um, couple of other things. The, the data acquisition process I think was the make or break about how this thing went out and was as successful as it is. So I'm just curious about where the level of effort was. And, you know, it seems like the functional requirements were pretty well specified, but somebody had to do a lot of work. And I'm wondering if you employed or whoever did it employed AI or if it was all done just by word searches on quote social media. That, that's a good an approach to um, 
that social media content, as you mentioned. Now, for the experts that took the time to acquire probably the top three, uh, it would be fair to say the top three most common social medias with Facebook, Twitter, and and another um, with news media outlets capturing the analytics on that uh, for purposes of social media. Yeah, um, it's interesting that uh, that other part of Reddit um, wasn't 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 uh, provided. And there, there, there's a valuable there's a valid reason for it, I'm sure. Um, I, I, but I, I got to tell you, with CISA, with CISA's relationship with FEMA and other FCC and other um, government agencies, NTIA and and many others that we collaborate with um you can see how it's very successful our collaboration is uh is working it, it's it's proof that it's working and it's and it's and it's it's being very well um provided to society in concert as we come together it, almost on a weekly basis there's visible improvements in CISA's holistic mm -hmm. security from the start and open source is the best way to achieve that rather yes. than a roadmap for the bad guys. So yep. in that, I, in part, I want to attribute that to why I was impressed. Nobody was chattering about Rick rolling it, but the next black hat uh, conference will reveal what did and didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And there may be information to be gained from that. Yes. So I, I'm real impressed that the government is moving as fast as it is in what is really a logical direction uh, in terms of this kind of effort. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm impressed with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you with that. I'm impressed as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you, you got a fun job ahead of you. Uh, you youngster <laughs> talking about it really amuses me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, sir. I'm calling you, sir, at the yeah. great level you're headed for. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I wouldn't say that, but thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Like I said, yeah. it's always good. To, it really is good to hear from you. I said, I'm not missing this one for anything. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Dan. And uh, um, yeah, if you guys have time, uh, you know, uh, we have our, our um, every other Sunday, the second Sunday of each month, the fourth Sunday of each month at 3 p.m. Central. Uh, I, I'm sorry, 2, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, we have our 60 meter net. Then we go to uh, DMR 31673. Then we go to a D star reflector. And then we have the uh, 40, 40 meter um, lower sideband frequency where we check in our nets with Oxcom. Uh, we have an average of about 100 operators that check in every other weekend on Sunday. And uh, it's gaining popularity and momentum, knowing that um, we have the ability to work with many different amateur radio community outlets and organizations for activation. And I got to tell you that I'm very proud of our our RecWigs throughout the country, uh, our amateur radio operators, the resources that are there. It's incredible. Um, inherently, how people in the amateur community have the interest to help society and to communicate. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. And um, to give you an idea, the Chicago marathon, we had 165 radio operators participated in the marathon and every medical tent through the whole racing circuit, every mile marker had amateur radio operators positioned using the various 440 two meter repeaters to transmit information to the public safety uh, administrators at the forward command center that certain runners needed medical attention or they saw a suspicious person. Out of the 65 amateur radio operators that were involved in the Chicago Marathon, augmenting that capability and inoperability from, from their volunteered sources is incredible. I mean, that's what Oxcom, that's one piece of the puzzle what an example of what Oxcom can do to civil service, and it's amazing. I'd like to make a, a, an announcement in support of my colleague, Mike Foster. Um, he's the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinator in Region 7, in those states, those five states he has. 
the leadership there at the FEMA headquarters at that regional level have authorized a uh, uh, amateur radio suite, a room. They've, in they've installed the radios. They've installed the coax. They have the antenna on the roof with contractors. There's going to be, coming up soon, a shares system there, an RMS system in Region 7, where amateur operators can come in and be authorized to operate the equipment when they when they can augment our responses in Region 7. Not to mention just Region 7. Understand the fact that high-frequency communications, Region 2 in, in the islands, in Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, can have an incident. But, you know, we know propagation and wind link messages, how a message can go over Texas or a message that's being delivered from uh, being sent from St. Thomas and bound for another state because of propagation. It could be absorbed in the atmosphere or go over that state. But there's another state 600 miles away that's listening that has the ability to intercept that message. So it's not just it's just not specific to the region. We understand that reception is key and, and listening and retrieval to share that information is 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 important as well. I'm going to say 73 to you, to everybody. It's been a great uh, presentation, as always. Again, uh, Carl, thank you for uh, building this out like this. Well, this is a great presentation. I better mute Dan, because if I don't, he'll jump in here. And we'll say 73s, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>